All right, I think I should start. Um, hey, everyone. <laughs> um, so I didn't make slides for this session because um, I felt like I've already you know, spoken about, hey, Angie, I, have a, I reserved the chair for you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're in, you're in good company, though. <laughs> so um, we have Angie and then Catch, my two uh, co-maintainers for Drupal 8. I figured I would pull them in, um, you know, <laughs> if you guys are cool with that. Um, so again, I have I've no slides for this session because I've already spoken about Drupal 8 in my keynote. There's been sessions by each of the initiative leads. You know, Angie just did a session on Drupal 8 as well. I mean, like, we've talked about Drupal 8 a lot. And so I didn't want to, like, you know, talk about it again in a, in a formal manner. And instead, I wanted to make it a real conversation because it's a core conversation is the name of the track. And so there's a few things I did want to say, but I very much hope that people have questions for the three of us or for me. Uh, or for other people in the audience, and then we, you know, talk about things which are on your minds, um, and let's see how it goes. So, before I start, um, I wanted to maybe do a quick brain dump about how I'm feeling, you know, um, and so I'm feeling really well, <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> um, and I think every Drupal development cycle goes through phases. Um, like in the beginning of a Drupal development cycle, people are very nervous because nothing seems to happen. It's like, why is nobody working on code? And reality is most people are still upgrading their, their modules. <laughs> and so there is this, this angst. Um, but slowly but certainly, that starts to change and momentum of development starts to pick up. And so right now, it feels like you know there's quite a bit of momentum. You know, big batches are being submitted. Lots of people are working on things, um, and so you know a lot of great things are happening. And that's because we're getting closer and closer to the you know code freeze date, and because people are finally you know moving away from um, you know upgrading their modules to Drupal 7 to you know starting to look forward about what they want to do around Drupal 8, and so that's good. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with the momentum. I'm also very happy with the issue queue and the way the issue queue is being managed. And you know, big kudos to Catch. And, and yeah. <laughs> and not not only for not only for coming up with the um, you know with, with our new system of there being thresholds right uh, for criticals and, and major bugs. But also for you know managing the issue queue so well, and you know Angie and others as well. Um, so I feel really good about that. Um, however, um, there is things that I'm worried about, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but what I do want to tell you: between now and the next DrupalCon, we may feel different, <laughs> because what's going to happen right now is, you know, there's going to be more tension about getting things done before the code freeze date. And that makes people a little anxious. And because they're a little anxious, um, you know, the mood may change a little bit. And that's what has happened historically. And so I just wanted to give people a heads up <laughs> uh, that that may happen. And I think we should maybe, and maybe we can discuss this in the session. You know, is there things that we can do proactive, you know, in a proactive way to not only recognize um, that, that is going to happen, but are there things we can do now while we're in happy zone that um, could prevent some of that you know, stress and tension before the code freeze day to, to be less or maybe you know, even go away? So that's an interesting thing, I think, and it, it's a challenge to all of you to think a little bit about that and maybe make some suggestions. Um, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen because I'm, I'm now in a position where I need to start saying no more often, right? So in the beginning of the freeze of that development cycle, everything pretty much goes. Like, yep, great idea, let's do this and let's do this. But now we're slowly getting to a point where we need to be a little bit more restrictive as what we can still start. Like if there's a giant initiative that somebody wants to do, well, we need to carefully consider if it's still you know, a good idea to do it at this stage because 
chances are we will not get it done. Um, it also, um, all right, so that's one thing. The other thing is even with regards to the existing initiatives, right? Um, I think, Angie, in your, in your presentation, you showed, you know, here's what we were planning to do, here's how much we actually got done, and here's how much we still need to do. And we actually need to do a lot of work. <laughs> There's a lot of work left. And so that means that, you know, me and Catch and Angie and, and, and other people need to start saying no a little bit more. And that we need to think about what is a straight line from where we are today to, you know, getting something done by the end of the code freeze. And sometimes we tend to go like this, right? <laughs> or, you know, we can do this and we can do this. And so I think we need to start saying no to some of these things. And here's one example, and it's just an example. I don't, I don't necessarily want to call it out, uh, but the annotations patch that went in. Great work. I love annotations. Um, you know, I've used them extensively in the past. But technically speaking, um, it's something which wasn't strictly necessary um, to do the things that we wanted to do. We could have kept using info hoops um, for you know, another release. And so these are the kind of things that we need to carefully take in mind because the annotation patch took quite a bit of time, you know, several weeks, I think three weeks or so of work, and it took a lot of different people to review it, to provide feedback, and so it's actually taking away a lot of um, our time and attention from other things which we could be doing, which arguably could be considered to be in the critical path to say getting you know the symphony stuff in or getting web services completed. Um, and so one of the things I'll have to do more and more of as we get closer is to be more critical about these kinds of features uh, if we manage, if we want to manage towards this code free state now. The big thing here is that I cannot do that alone. Neither could you know, WebG, Catch, and I do this alone. It's really, if we want to scale as a community, we all need to be critical about these things. And we all need to help say no to these things. Because I can't go around and look at all of these issues and you know, figure out if this is really necessary or is this nice to have. And, and so this is kind of a call to action to all of you people working on on um, you know core to be critical about the things that we are working on, and it's I know it's difficult in a community where people work on things that they're passionate about, and we can't really tell people what to work on and what not. But um, we just need to be smart about it, or we're going to have a lot of stress and tension towards the end of the code freeze uh, and the feature freeze, right? Because people are going to say, "Well, we have all of this work left to do." <laughs> Um, and so I think if we can try to avoid that, that would be great. Um, all right. So another thing that I'm worried about is performance. Um, you know, we're adding a lot of things to core, and it may affect um, how fast we can serve pages. <laughs> um, at the same time, I was talking to Chicks. Is he here? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you were hiding. <laughs> But so Chicks came to me yesterday, he was all excited. Um, and he's, you know, we, we all know Chicks when he's excited, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we all, we all like it. But he was all excited, but in a, it was very positive in a sense. But like, you know, the issue the, with the issue queues are really well managed. Uh, and he's like, so what will we do between the code freeze and the actual, um, you know, release date that we put forward. Because he's, he's like, well, there's only 20 critical bugs. I mean, we fix it in a month. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have like five months left, he said. <laughs> Is that true, Chicks? Yeah. Oh, all right. Do we have that on the record? <laughs> um, and so, you know me, and I think there's a lot of truth. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. That's what I told him. I think there's a lot of things we need to do. To work on and you know hopefully we'll be in a better situation than we were before you know before we had like over a hundred critical bugs um, but hopefully that will give us more time to work on performance as well right um, so so performance is something that I'm worried about are there things you guys are worried about <laughs> <laughs> 
but I mean, I have my thing. So I'm worried about managing towards this release and making sure we work on the most important things and then performance. These are kind of two things that I'm worried about. I don't know, Catch or Angie, do you have other things? Um, to, to your point about, is this on? Whoa. Yep. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, to your point about the fact that we're in a happy zone and we're soon to be not in a happy zone, one of the things I'm kind of worried about is that we don't yet have any kind of infrastructure in place for supporting uh, conflict resolution and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think the number of conflicts in the core queue, even in the happy zone, have been rising, just as passions have been inflared and, and some people have, mm, how do we put this tactfully, a, uh, a, a, a creative expression of their anyway <laughs> some people <laughs> some like people poetry. just kind of like can get fixated on something and it's just like and we don't we don't have a process for 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 solving that other than like ping web chick or ping randy Fay or whatever i'm a little worried about that and so i think the work that we've done in the governance you know stuff is really important to try and get that community working group in place before the unhappy season so that we have some sort of a structure to, to handle this as we, as we go on. So um, I'm, I'm always worried about performance, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, but getting more worried. And uh, I think the other thing is the, we've got like a lot of, we're trying to put as much infrastructure in as we can so that we can use it, but we're not really using a lot of things yet very much. Um, so we could end up in a situation where we have like the new stuff and then the old stuff is still there which we always do every release, like the same with the entity system in Drupal 7, we only just about use that now in Drupal 8. But I would really love it if we didn't do it so much in Drupal 8 and we actually got, like we, pl like we use the plugin system for like pro as many plugins as we can and we have like proper request response handling for as many page callbacks and boxes po as we possibly can um, so that we don't have this like half assed like four things that like one of them was added in 4.7, one was added in Drupal 6, one was added in Drupal 8 that all did the same thing. And we still haven't ripped out the old one because we never actually got to the patch that did it. Um, so any any stuff that's like finishing that, that would be great. Which, 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 gets back to, which gets back to a question of what we're gonna do in between November and February and August. And the, and, the, and the question that we discuss often and among initiative leads and all kinds of people who work on all kinds of stuff is that, is that it would be good to have some more clarity on what's the kind of non-feature thing for conversions things to, conversion of things to the infrastructure that we're built in and, and w if you can provide examples of what you think that would be feasible there so that would help us focus on really the features or the infrastructure to build in and then we can do the conversions and the rest later. So, I might get into trouble, but for, for me, like, uh, what what I wanted to do ages ago was basically if we kept under the thresholds, just allow, if we kept under the thresholds, we would gradually lower the thresholds during code, like that mm. freeze freeze. And if we stayed under, any old crap can get in while we're under because it means we're doing well and we can still release. And you can put API changes, UA changes, stuff like that. We, uh, like we might not do that, but what I, but I think if we're comfortable that we can release, then we should try to convert stuff because even if someone's module port gets messed up in March next year, like everyone's module port in September will be considerably easier. So from my point of view, like it, we need to get tighter and tighter and tighter, but we should. Right, we're trying to get API additions into Drupal 7. Yeah, and he's giving me a look. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 only giving, well, I'm only giving you a look because I think your question was slightly different. You wanted to know uh, my, my, well, maybe it's not different, but it, it, it's like, take CMI, because I know CMI a little bit better. CMI has uh, a bunch of things that have to happen. For example, UI to convert or to do synchronization, import, export. Because the thing I showed in the video isn't actually in core. It's... It's a patch that we rejected because it was so uh, unintuitive that it would, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I mean, it's totally in core, it's ready to go now. Uh, it's only that, and then another thing that needs to happen for CMI to succeed is we need to do conversions of all of the settings pages to CMI. And I think the question was more like, can we punt some of that kind of stuff until after feature freeze, right? Is that what you asked or? Yeah, there's a lot of intricacies there. So those conversions turn out issues for a multilingual that might turn into features that we figure out we're missing. 
So I'm not saying that should be postponed. I'm yeah. saying that that if if it needs to be postponed, then then what what to what extent it's totally okay because mm -hmm. we are just it's not features. So, but I don't think we know yet, right? I think it's all going to depend on how things are at when we freeze. And you know, if we if we're in really good shape, I don't. I personally don't think it's it's meaningful to release Drupal eight sooner than we set for it. Um, but anyway, it's my personal opinion. We c we can discuss that as a community, obviously, and, and maybe we should. But um, so if you ask me right now, I would say if we're in really good shape, um, you know, we can keep adding features effectively, and I, I think that's along the lines of what you know Catch is hoping for. I think as well <laughs> with, with his system and things like changing like a variable get to like a config get and stuff that it's like borderline API changes, and we we should just we should we have to get it done. So if like we, we, we just have to call them like major tasks and, and see. Yeah. I think an important thing about so it, one sorry. thing, if maybe quickly introduce yourself and then ask your question um, so people know. Okay, I'm Jess. I'm XJM. Um, Thank you. And I, I think that a thing that is different about uh, the CMI conversions is that if those don't happen, CMI as a concept doesn't work. Whereas a lot of these other sort of like API cleanup refactor things that we want to do, um, like the configurable stuff. If if core doesn't use its own API for that, like if if node types don't get converted, that's kind of crappy for DX. But at the same time, we can still ship with it. So I, that seems to me like something that's much safer to do much later in the release cycle. And I mean, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? I, because it and, and and things that are being introduced for the initiatives that are like that are like new as part of their API, I think is probably d different from stuff that's already a part of core that we're right. changing. So that was my. And, and, and I agree. And you know, I actually suggested that you know, to come back to the annotations example, for example, I actually yeah. suggested that you know, uh, annotations could have been. It's a, it's an example of something which could have been done later, because I mean, uh, 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 anyway, do you disagree or? Well, for for annotations in particular, I would say that it it made views conversion go a lot faster, right. probably. But, but yeah. So the thing is, there's always an argument to do something. <laughs> And, and yeah, it will make views conversion faster. It did. Yeah, it did. We did it in six. All right, any questions from the audience? Because I, I could keep talking, but I really want to make this a conversation. Doug? Doug Green. Um, I already asked Myers this question. I'm curious on, on your take of it. I'm a little concerned that we don't, I don't know who the major corporate customer is going to be as a beta user. You know, we had so many bugs we found through mm -hmm. Examiner and Acquia, you know, Gardens, baking this in early, and I don't know if we have anyone like that doing that with eight. Mm. Well, that's a good question. I don't know either. <laughs> um, anyone planning to use Drupal 8 early on? Can we tempt you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so solid. Chicks thinks it can be done There's in a month. head. There's uh, a head. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I think it's you know we'll, it, we're a little bit too close. I think, um, but you know, not too close. We're a little bit too far away from Drupal eight being ready enough. I mean, it's still a year from now. Um, but hopefully, some companies will emerge. Chicks. So, because everybody is harping on this, if you uh, look at the state of core, we have a, a couple hundred tests with about uh, 40,000 assets, and they consistently pass. Uh, what I was referring to Drish yesterday was that last fall, when we have introduced the thresholds and begin to uh, refactor Drupal very seriously, we made an agreement that we can comment out tests to get some refactors in and open criticals for them to fix. This was the process that we agreed on. We never needed to do that, actually. So this is why I said that we are in a surprisingly good, we are in a surprisingly <coughs> solid state. And this is why I believe that we are at a much better place than we were when we were doing Drupal 7. For example, we, it took about a year to get the upgrade path fixed. Now we have upgrade uh, pass uh, test and we have a solid upgrade pass. So all those things that uh, were uh, hindering the 7 uh, cycle is not, uh, it's clearly not happening now. It doesn't mean that we will not find new things, but I think I still think that we are in a, a very good shape. 
and that's because of the tests that solid that always pass. Now, for a question, do we have any ideas of what we are going to do to stop patches getting committed from a uh, needs review state? <laughs> uh, what do you mean by that question? Sorry. What, what we're going to do to stop patches being committed? From a needs review state instead of the RTBC state? Um, that, that doesn't happen often, does it? <laughs> it doesn't. It does, I mean, I, I don't remember. Uh, do you have examples? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but I, th I think at the end of the day, it seems like it's, I mean, I should give your example, but um, I think it happens once out of 100 patches, not, not even, I think. Sorry? Uh, quite probably, but, the, but there, this was a particularly big one very recently because the bundle patch went in. Uh, while I was actually, when you committed it, I was actually reviewing it with Kat. So oh, it but it was not RTBC? No, mm. it, in case you didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> so that I really would like that not to happen. It, whenever it happens, it's really annoying. It's 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 very it, it it's hard enough to keep up with the RTBC queue, but to keep up with the CNR queue uh, in case it gets committed, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's it's I look at these on a case per case basis. I mean, I I, I don't remember the details of the bundle patch right now, but I believe it had been RTBC and it had been worked on and I looked at it um, and we looked at it together even with Angie and, and Alex and, and others and we felt it was good to go. So, you know, we can always go back and fix things after it landed. Um, yeah, so. of course. And, and just to point out that um, core committers generally are core committers because they were really kick-ass patch reviewers before. So, like, I don't I don't necessarily think that that should be a rule that we can't commit something from needs review. But yeah, if you see something that's effed up, mark it back to needs work. You know, we always reiterate on stuff that we and do. And if and we've, there has been instances where patches were committed that broke things terribly, whether they were RTBC or not, um, and then we roll them back. It's usually not a not a big deal. Um, hey, Marie. Uh, is my people at all his name? Um, basically, what I guess the the concern that I have is that we are do only have three months left, and mm -hmm. we're doing some major changes, um, and especially when we're looking at what's happening with the templating engine and stuff like that. Um, if we are in a good state where right. we only have you know that small amount of bugs, etc., you know, is there a possibility, or should we be looking at possibly extending that analysis time? to kind of, you know, really work out what's happening like in regards to how the templating is going to work in the scotch and how scotch is going to fit in with the back. It just seems like there's a lot of work there and, um, you know, possibly need a little bit more analysis with that or... Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good question. So the question is really are we going to, you know, extend the code well, freeze? I, I mean, how right? confident are we that, that, you know, because it's such a big change, you know, it really, really is. Mm -hmm. um, how confident are we that come three months' time that we're going to have, and as I, I'm kind of more even just talking about the front end stuff, let alone, the right. you know, a lot of what's going on there. And just because of the, all the interaction with everything, you know, how confident are we that we're going to be able to be in a state where we're going to have ironed out a lot of that so we don't end up with a Drupal 8 that's got kind of what we want happening, but because we didn't get everything in there, we're still having to have a lot of exceptions in there for... Right. Things. Uh, it's a tough one because, um, I mean, we set a date. Um, you know, that date has been set for a while, right? Yeah. And I think it's our job to try and work towards, you know, that date. And whatever date we set, you know, if we extend it, there's going to be other things which are at the phase where, you know, the team system is right now. And it's always going to be this discussion, always. It's just going to mean these things get in, but then these other things, which we then started, <laughs> you know. And so I don't think, I don't think that actually solves any problems. Uh, it just, you know, allows certain things to get in, but then it's still frustrating for other people in the end. So, like right now, I'm not planning to extend yeah. the code freeze date. So. Cool. Karen. Uh, yeah, I'm Karen Stevenson. Karen Stevens and Karen S. Um, you talk about having like a big example site to sort of test things on. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that 
really gives an opportunity to test things is contrib modules, right? So when contrib starts converting, a lot of times that's the thing that sort of flushes mm. out the fact that something's not working. So um, my thinking is, you know, and I don't know the best, I mean, it's one thing to just go tell everybody, con oh, hey, contrib, you should go get upgraded to D8 while it's changing constantly, which is really hard to do. Mm. Um, but just kind of any kind of thing to, m and there's some big changes here, and, and I know as a contrib, author that like until I came here I felt like I was completely losing track of where some of these things were going in and you know so you've got to do this whole education process and get your head around what's going on and then and then do the work of doing the upgrade so anything that we can do to support contrib modules mm -hmm. in getting upgraded to D8 I think will provide some good yeah testing of how this actually is working out in reality yeah, and this is actually a good time um, to bring it up as we're getting closer to co code freeze. It also means, you know, effectively once, uh, sorry, feature freeze, I keep mixing them up. Uh, but, you know, once we're feature frozen, that, that may actually be a good time to start, you know, making sure things like Coder module work again and like all of our documentation is in, in good shape to help people with those migrations. So if you, that effectively means, you know, that the maintainers of Coder module, they sort of need to, you know, start working on <laughs> getting their module ready for Drupal, you know, for Drupal 8 migrations. Um, so this is a, actually a good time to start, you know, to Karen's point, to start, you know, building up the machine <laughs> to help, you know, well, to help, first of all, 15,000 modules to be converted from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, but then even bigger is to, you know, we need to now educate tens of thousands of developers around the world on, on all of these changes and we need to, you know, make them symphony developers. <laughs> and so how are we gonna do this? And it's a giant, massive project and I think it's another good reason why it makes sense to have a long code freeze, frankly, because it's gonna take people, you know, quite some time to, to learn all about all of the changes and to feel, to get to a point where they have enough confidence in their symphony skills and like, I don't know, it just, it's a, gonna be a big process in my mind. Um, I don't know if you want to add something, Angie, or, or catch in, in terms of what we need to do there. You don't have to if you don't have anything. <laughs> Um, well, one, one thing that would help support that a little bit is um, we, uh, thanks to the work of Jennifer Hodgden and a couple of other people, we moved to this, uh, you know, in the past when we tracked our API changes, it was an enormous wiki page of doom that crashed Chrome when you looked at it because there was so much crap on it. So now it's a little better. Um, it's like little nodes, but the nodes also keep track of things like does this have a coder upgrade rule attached to it yet? And does this have the documentation updated? And where does the documentation that affects this live? Is it themer documentation? Is it site builder documentation? And stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of people maybe in this audience as well as maybe listening after who, um, you know, you don't feel like you're one of the hardcore people that are in the core queue 24 seven and notice things like patches getting committed from needs review. but you do care about Drupal 8 and you really want to help in some way, these sort of infrastructure related tasks would be a really great move. So, you know, if you are able to port Coder Upgrade to Drupal 8 and start making little rules for each of the things in that list and start checking them off, that's going to completely accelerate the velocity of getting people to use Drupal 8 on day one. Um, and I think, the, I, I think I can speak for the Coder module maintainers when they say they don't want that responsibility. Are they here by the themselves. way? I see Doug and I know Stella is somewhere. Sorry, that? Still and I pass the porch back to me with her family. Uh, right, so now Doug is the maintainer. And we'll, we'll just print on it tomorrow when I've got it out of my contract department. Oh, perfect. So if you're interested in helping with that, Doug is going to be uh, leading a uh, sprint tomorrow so you can help, uh, help, help kind of get that infrastructure in place because it's extremely valuable. If you want your work to have a big impact, it's hard to have a bigger impact than helping hundreds of thousands of developers uh, contributed modules and custom modules and everything. Uh, make the jump from seven to eight more easily. So Next question. One of your things you brought up was uh, worried about performance on like how performant Drupal 8's gonna be. I'm curious if right now we have tests that relate to like except prof right. or whatever that's called for automated testing of performance. And also for that, on the front end side of it, doing stuff like uh, web page test, automated testing, and mm -hmm. JavaScript testing unit. Because right now, as far as I know, there's not anything. 
Right, yeah, and um, yeah, so there is no real performance testing right now in, in an in an automated fashion and it's something that we've dreamt of for many years, to be honest. Like we've always talked about how great it would be to have continuous performance testing. Um, the, other, the other thing with that is not something you can do with Drupal 8, but Drupal 7 now because it has a lot of uh, install profiles. Mm -hmm. You could inst create some tests around install profiles and yeah. kind of automate that, and that would uh, bring in contrib as well. Right. For so performance testing, there's um, there aren't any, but there is a sandbox. Um, I've forgotten where it's gone. Um, but either Pajibus or Mark Sonnenbaum is the maintainer and there is stuff in there like there's a thing that will let you run like a basically a simple test test and then get the XH prof output from that so if anyone wants to work on that that would be really amazing because we've wanted it for years and years and years but we don't have it um, the chances of getting it on the test spot like usefully for Drupal 8 are low but having things that people could run locally would be good and having it so that we have it like early in Drupal 9 would be good now. Like if we if we want it for Drupal 9, someone needs to start working on it now and get it running. And it's like, because that's, that's, it could take a year to really, really get it going. Um, but like if, if you care about this, like manually profiling core, like I had a quick look the other week and we were running like 14 delete queries on every page because of like a one liner in the cashback end. Like stuff like that still goes in, so you just get get extra hit any page you're bound to find something, open issues for it. Um, it you know, and if you don't know how to use it, but you do, that's a good way to learn. And I think it's actually a great way for people to get involved in Drupal. I mean, it's can probably be a little little bit challenging, but just profiling and you know performance testing Drupal core. And you know, finding things and then digging into code and like trying to figure out what, what why it is slow. It, it's a great way to learn about Drupal, and it, it actually builds up a great skill, a skill that's much wanted. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of organizations that need these kinds of people that can help them uh, make their Drupal sites faster. So it's a great way to to learn about Drupal. It's a great way to build up some unique skill sets that many many people don't have. So, next question. Yeah, I'm Thomas Svensson, and. Um, if we look today, Drupal now is a multi-year release between mm -hmm. majors. And uh, it's not really until you start trying to build sites and there is a healthy amount of contrib modules where you start to discover that a lot of functionality in core is actually incomplete. If you take um, the uh, contrib token module from mm -hmm. Drupal 7, adding the list of um, available tokens and those kind of, and also missing tokens in core. Um, wouldn't it be, be good if those things can be added easier in point releases and not have to live in course you or contrib? Uh, yes, I, I think it would be. Um, so the, the thing we're always balancing is uh, we've bec became more relaxed over time, but we have a policy of, um, you know, once we have a major release of not breaking APIs and, you know, uh, making sure that websites can easily upgrade. And so, Early on, we didn't allow for any new things to be added. Right now, we do have a policy that we can add new features and functionality as long as it doesn't break existing websites. And we, we're a little strict about that, though, because um, you know, because we don't want to like you know, we don't want to break any websites basically when when people upgrade. Um, you know, going forward, I think. One conversation that I would like to have, and it's not just today, but like it's going to be quite the conversation, is do we want to change our position on backwards compatibility? Um, like, you know, and I'm slowly warming up um, to a model which um, basically maybe maintains backward compatibility for one release. And so that gives us potentially the best of both worlds where we can make. API changes, we don't need to maintain them forever. We need to maintain them for one release, right? And so Drupal 7 module would run straight on Drupal 8, for example. Um, however, um, so we would basically, the problem though is it would be more work for the core developers. Uh, so we need to talk about these trade-offs. Um, 
Another advantage is if we did maintain backwards compatibility for a release, we may be able to do more releases, and that could actually get more core developers into Drupal. Um, and we could do maybe a yearly release or whatever, you know, rhythm we, we choose as a, as a community. And that would, to loop it back to your question, that would enable us to, you know, to make, you know, maybe bigger changes. Uh, in a lot of these problems with, with the server at the time scale that potentially makes another life really hard because we have to find workarounds right. and learn how to pay and right. apply patches and so on. All these kinds of things we don't really have much experience of. Right. I, th I think it's it's a it's a it's a great topic. It's been an ongoing conversation. I, th I think it will continue to be a conversation. I don't think we need to resolve it now. I, I don't think I would change our position right now. But maybe as we wrap up Drupal 8 in those six months of what do we do, <laughs> that would be a great conversation to have. And then you know once we start Drupal 9, you know we can implement the change like this if we choose as a community to to pursue that. So. I just want to chime in here one quick sec. Sorry, Chicks. But um, uh, just to point out, we, we have actually added a number of features to Drupal 7. We have actually filled out a number of missing holes in Drupal 7. We haven't done things like move the entirety of Entity API module into core or anything like that. But um, you know, a lot of places where contrib is running up against, shit, you know, shoot, we don't even have a hook to inject right here so I can alter a... I don't know, a widget info or something like that. And so we're like, okay, well, let's make sure that there's a hook there, you know. And so we'll, we actually do, as contributed module authors hit problems, as long as the issue gets to RTPC um, and, it, and, it's, and it doesn't break anything. And we, you know, David Rothstein is amazing at telling, he can foresee the future of any kind of bugs are going to happen stuff. But he's really good at like analyzing that stuff. And there's actually a number of things that we've, we've committed to Drupal 7 to make that easier. And we can do that because we have all the automated tests. So I think as we go forward as a project, we can get more and more loose as we get more experience with it. But I think right now, I think we have the right balance between like, we could add that, but that might break other people's sites, so we're not gonna do that. That has living trip, but this thing totally makes sense and the risk is very low, so we'll move that in. But it is pretty much case per case basis at the moment. Chicks again? Yeah, so uh, about uh, the Drupal 8, uh, Drupal 8 country bosses needing to learn Symfony that I just want to reassure everybody, you probably won't need to do it because most of the symphony things are not going to be uh, visible on a module level. We mo most likely will right. not get there. Uh, one thing, second thing, uh, I begin to think about this and one thing that people actually, or more like the companies people work for, could help with is to have free trainings for contrib authors because the training that a country bolster needs is very different from what a site builder needs. And obviously most of them don't have the money uh, for training and they need training because if you look at most country modules, so that was an idea. People what couldn't see his face, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as for BC compatibility, actually Drupal 9 is uh, probably, a I just wanted to say uh, before you elaborated that 8 is not a good day, but 9 is probably is because we are getting uh, to, to the point uh, uh, where the code is not the spaghetti it was. So that, that's all I uh, wanted oh, to say. These are two good points. Uh, we couldn't do it, uh, just wanted to say that we couldn't do it before because mm -hmm. the whole code was so interconnected that uh, you change one API and everything breaks. So it was really impossible to do BC uh, so far. All right, well, thank you. Good point. Ryan? Um, I had a question about views in core, basically. Okay. Um, I actually like this in core, but it's one of the things that gives users a surprising amount of ability to shoot themselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. And it's been kind of nice as in contrib because <laughs> There's a thought that when you download Drupal core, anything you can click together in Drupal core should perform and that that's Drupal's job to make mm -hmm. that happen. Clearly, that's not true for views. You can make things that perform very poorly. Right. Has there been any thought to adding hooks to allow either contrib <laughs> or core? <laughs> <laughs> to allow either contrib or core to give users guidelines on either how to write views or a very large set of examples on common views right. for sites. Can we get the module closer? 
<laughs> I think I think chicks wrote a module that tells you if you have bad joins in your views. He did. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Does that work, chicks? No. <laughs> <laughs> It never detected any bad so, joints. But if the module exists, then it must. <laughs> if the module exists in my Blair, do you mean like an actual like in core? You make a really bad view, and it says, "You, you look what you've done." <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, or at least examples, because you can never like a user will always be able to find a new way to do something poorly. But <laughs> examples for like com common idioms, and I know that the work for getting views in isn't, but. At least getting the discussion started about it, I hadn't yeah. heard it. I mean, it it would be cool to have like an issue to discuss whether that would be like a feature that we could add. Like, I would think probably um, Boyan would want to talk about how to do it because, like, big you know, you make a view and then you get a big red warning and it says your view is going to destroy your site, <laughs> and the guys got like they've got like three nodes of four <laughs> users. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, but. Something, or at least, or at least, making sure that it's still easy for Jigsaw's module to work, or you know. But um, but also, I mean, but I mean, there are things in Core that perform really badly that you can you can you can enable statistics module and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and forum module and stuff like that. Well, forums actually not as bad as it used to be now. Sorry. Add a thousand yeah. fields, yeah. So, so but, I mean, but nothing compares to, to <laughs> something that you would expect to be able to do. I know. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not saying it's a technical issue. It's a. It's a I think in general it's a great principle, though. Like we should try and protect users from, you know, Ourselves? destroying their sites. <laughs> 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 so it, I think, I'll, you know, we'll take it as a call to action, and hopefully we can have a discussion around it. Um, Mark. Yes. Um, just a comment about the uh, the automated performance testing idea. Uh, huh? So, we, like I said, we looked at that a little while back, um, and. Doing some of the profiling on Drupal 8 so far on the big patches, I found it's a little more complex than what we would get from that um, because it's not as if we have patches going in and we can say that we had this performance regression and it's because of this patch. It's we have incremental changes going in. Like, so say the kernel, to, we bootstrap much farther to mm -hmm. even instantiate the kernel to get functionality that we had earlier in the bootstrap before. So right now we have a much, much larger code path uh, when that went in, but it's not to say when you look at that issue, it's like, well, we have a 10% regression, we need to, or we can't put it in. It's we just may need to make sure to follow up and take out right. all of the old code we don't need anymore. Because, like working on the HTTP cache, there I found there's a lot of code there that's really redundant with what's in the kernel. Right. Yeah, just so I have a, I opened an issue this week, which is like a critical task to fix all the performance regressions one way or the other. So, um, what I want to try and do is list the issues that we know like regress performance and then list the issues that are going to fix them in some way whether they're related or not necessarily um so that we can track that because we because we are we are like unknowingly committing patches that have performance regressions and sometimes unknowingly but it's i mean it's exactly true that the, we, we put stuff in and then we might not even use it and we don't have a performance regression until it's used by every core module like six months later so um but like i really don't want Drupal 8 to come out and be slower than Drupal 7, which was slower than Drupal 6, which was slower than Drupal 5. Like it would be nice to actually get. All, and it, I think if we go, if we go all the way through what we've done, then we, there's so many wonderful things that we will be able to do to make people's sites blazing fast, like both front end performance and service, like just server side performance and scalability. Everything could be lovely if we get there. So, oh. but like. As we're getting closer to code freeze, um, I'm quite happy to bump the issues that have to finish this to not have regressions to critical tasks because if not, we have like nasty, nasty performance regressions in eight months. Um, so, but so please help. I'll f pull that issue up somewhere, and if people can help and like identify what, what what we do, then we can like figure out where we really need to focus on like performance over the next six months. Uh, and maybe we can make it part of our default you know workflow like we have these meta issues and like you know one issue one thing broken down into 10 issues maybe there should be a step 11 you know after everything got in like you know step 11 is to do performance testing and maybe we can start by tracking it better i don't know all right 
Jax, welcome back. Yeah, I just came back up, uh, but apparently others remember this module that I have written, which analyzes it. <laughs> and uh, dust check indexes. I, ha I mean, it's a Drupal 6 module, but it's about 50 lines of code. It's trivial to port to 8. And What's the name? Avoid. Avoid. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Check so it out. Yeah, there, Avoid module. There is module. something uh, to warn people that they are doing during that they shouldn't really do. All right, thank you. My name is Sebastian Osio. Um, I have a question regarding how well you think you're doing engaging people to come into core. The thing is, uh, I know Drupal a year now, maybe more, and I think the, the curve to learn the mm -hmm. through the website is a bit too steep, and I think it shouldn't be. It's not actually that difficult. But maybe um, I haven't found the ways through the website or through the initiatives that are really like, but you say in German, mm -hmm. like preparing you to, to be able to engage into, into work that is really needed and everybody's asking for. So I think we can always do better at this. However, I do feel like we as a community are pretty remarkable in terms of trying to get people in through a lot of different things we do. Um, from tagging issues to organizing sprints, and you know, Jess is a prime example of somebody who's very passionate about getting more people into the door. You want to yeah. say a few things about? Okay, so I'd like to point out specific things that we are actually doing to try to engage new core contributors. Um, one thing is there is we do office hours um, twice a week in the Drupal IRC channel. It, the premise is that anyone who has some Drupal Cypher link experience can come and get a self-contained task to work on an issue in core. So all they have to do, they don't have to have any special skills um, and it, it won't be any special particular issue. It might be something that's as trivial as, you know, like clean up the comments in a patch, but that gives them a, a chance to interact directly with core developers. Um, another thing that we're, do, we're do actually doing, this is a great lead in and thank you, I wanted to mention something. Like, we're doing a sprint on Friday um, that is, if you haven't contributed to Core before and you're interested, um, we have a free training that um, Addison Berry and the Drupal Eyes Me team are doing to train people, sort of bootstrap them, and this is what these are the tools that you need to contribute to Core. Here's how you navigate the Core issue queue. Here's the kinds of things you can work on, and we're going to be doing more of those trainings. We've done six so far. This will be the seventh, and there'll be there's one today. We'll do another one at Bad Camp, and so on. Um, there's another thing I'd really like to highlight is. Um, the Drupal Ladder Initiative, uh, drupalladder.org is the URL. This is a program where um, it's designed for local user groups to make part of their, their weekly meetups be learning how to contribute to core and then taking a particular issue in core and working on it as a user group. So th that's like th there's like three different paths that we can take and um, I, I guess sort of making people aware of them is, is a big deal because I mean, <coughs> All these things, all these things have been here for people like a year now. All, all these three things have existed. So, um, if yeah. anyone has any suggestions on how to promote that better and how to make people more aware, that's great. But I guess the biggest thing is word of mouth. You know, tell, tell, go to your local user group and say, "Hey, come to office hours. Hey, do you want to try this Drupal ladder thing?" And I'm sure that the people who are working on that would love to help you. So, <coughs> if anyone so has any ideas? So, how amazing is that? That you know, people like Jess and you know, I think Brian is Brian here from the Drupal ladder, I mean, that they're all like, you know, doing this, this work to get more, more people in. I think it's very unique. Um, yeah. <laughs> Follow up, don't applaud for me. I would really like it if there would be more people who want to help mentor this stuff because I, I'd like to work on core myself. So <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're interested, if you have some experience contributing to Drupal, it doesn't have to be that you're, you don't have to be catch. But if you have some experience working in the Drupal core issue queue, please ping me and I would love to help you help me. <laughs> so you can, if you have like two hours a week that you can answer someone's questions on IRC, or on the other hand, you know, ping Brian if you'd like to have more information on how to, how to set up a ladder for your local loser group. So this is not a closed box. If, if you if you see this as a problem, please come and talk to us, and you can help us mentor new contributors if you have two hours a week. What is your handle again? Um, I'm XJM. Okay. Because I really uh, want to contact people on LinkedIn. Yes. That's one thing that we talk about a lot, and I don't think it's something that we are really scared by contributing grants 
Yay. You can, also, you can also go to drupalada.org and contact any of the maintainers of any of the lessons on that uh, site. You can contact them through the email. So does anyone know how much time we have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> there must be more questions. Don't be shy. I have a question. You have a question. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> not actually not for you for the audience. Uh. Um, so so <laughs> I, I work at Aquia, I work with Drees, um, I work with Gabor and Jesse Beach, and I work with Wim Lears. And for the past three months we have been working our asses off on the Spark distribution, which is for Drupal seven and right now. Um, but the goal has always been for Spark to be, uh, you know, recommending authoring experience improvements to Drupal 8 core, and we're using Drupal 7 as a vehicle for that in order to allow people to actually try this stuff on real sites and, and stuff like that. I would love, like, we've done a lot of sessions, we've done a lot of boffs, we've had some great discussions here. I would love to get a sense from the room as to whether or not we have agreement that this stuff would be fucking awesome in core and we can go balls out trying to get it into Drupal 8 or if we should stick to contrib. Does anybody have any comments on that? So. All right, quick uh, poll. Yes. Yeah, we need to do a poll. All right. Um, I, I haven't seen many of the workshops, but I've looked at some of the videos online and I've downloaded the demo thing and had a play and I think it is incredibly awesome. I just want to say that and I would be incredibly excited to see that in 8. But I also am concerned if it's too much work and we don't get it in there, do we have anything? And so I was talking to um, Nate, quick sketch if he's here, about the sort of like the low end version of improvements. Um, you know, is that, you know, if we, if, if we can't make, if we can't have all of the wonder of Spark, what's plan B? I think the all of the wonder of Spark requires a lot of the architecture stuff that has to happen for other initiatives anyway. So it would be a way of funneling in resources to Drupal 8 that don't exist right now because they're on Drupal 7 um, and very frigging smart people that are awesome. Um, so I think that the plan B would just be, you know, if we if we work our butts off and we try and get all of these things like blocks and layouts in place and filter system improvements in place and this other stuff, and then we get to the end and um, we it, it, we don't quite have the the WYSIWYG patch ready yet or this that and the other thing, they would they would continue to live and contrib for Drupal eight. But I think I don't know. I would really like to work on it. Um, do people agree? Yay. Okay. Does anybody want to hit me with a tomato? <laughs> okay. <awesome. laughs> we'll have a tomato boff. Right <laughs> yeah. Did you want to mic it or? Are you? Okay. Uh, true. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. Tomato <laughs> fun. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, it's not a question again, but it kind of is. So in your keynote, you talked about the, pro the problem of core developer sustainability, core contributor sustainability yep. in general, which is something that I think concerns a lot of people. And so I'd like to repeat something that Alex said in one of the core conversations earlier in this week, which is if you have a company that wants some of this stuff like Spark, like um, configuration management, like Fusion Core, for example, um, please encourage that company to um, either donate money or developer time or any kind of thing, if they get in contact with the initiative leader for whichever initiative, um, every, you, what you hear over and over again in these core conversations, every single initiative lead says, please, we have these huge blockers, we need more help. So if you can talk to the people you work for and get them to help donate either your resources or, or financial resources or whatever, that would help a lot too. Anyone else? No more questions. Wow. <laughs> so we, have, we have a few minutes left. All right, I guess I'll just, I'll just say one more thing. One more thing on like just the uh, the forthcoming ah, freakout phase. Like 
Can we all just like make a pact to each other that we're going to remember that even when we're back behind our computers and we're all little blue nicknames on the internet and stuff like that, that, you know, <laughs> please remember this moment when we are all sitting together, we are all people, we are all human beings, we all really wanted Drupal to kick ass and try to keep that in mind because the tensions will raise. We are going to get into fights with each other, but let's just really try our best to treat each other with respect and treat each other well and know that no matter what the disagreement's about, we all want what's best for Drupal. Thanks. Yeah, well said. <laughs> All right. Before we wrap up, maybe one more thing. You know, raise your hand or stand up if you actually have a patch in core. Seven, eight, whatever it is. Wow. Cool. Both. <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> so that's a lot of people. How many people have not com contributed yet? To core. to core, yeah. Do it on Friday. <laughs> All right. I will personally review your patch and see if we can commit it. <laughs> I may commit it from the needs review state. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, thank you.